Welcome, uh, Girish Khanna, uh, who everybody knows is a, is a is more famous than anybody sitting over here. <laughs> <laughs> Not only because he's a film and TV actor, director, poet, but above all, he's a, he's a man of uh, the theatre. He was 26 when he produced his one of his really most outstanding plays, Good Luck. Uh, and I can't help being uh, a person to note here that in the early 70s uh, there was a production of uh, Tuklak directed by Om Shivpuri. The, the best production, I believe, is you know, the one that was directed by Abraham al Kazi with Manohar Singh as the, in the lead. But there was also another production which Shivpuri had directed, and there was this famous uh, scene of the of the of the older soldier and the and the young soldier and and in my amateur theatre days I played the role of the young soldier. I had a couple of lines. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, uh, he's known to to me uh, and to everybody for a long time. Uh, this is, as you know, the fifth Golden Jubilee lecture uh, in a series uh, to celebrate the 50th year of the CSDS. Uh, and uh, uh, Girish has been uh, was preceded in this series by uh, Sheldon Pollock, Veena Das, Arjun Abadurai, and David Shulman. The other thing I want to tell you was that Girish is, is a member of the board of governors of CSTS, so he has, we have a claim on him, not just as a as an important uh, uh, playwright and and a winner of many, many awards, but also as, as one of us, he's part of, the, uh, part of the small community uh, that we uh, that call the CSDS. Now, Kirish is, one can very easily say, uh, without any inhibitions, that he is one of the founders of modern Indian theatre, along with Vijay Tandutar, Mohan Rakesh, and Dharavya Bharti. Is undoubtedly one of the, one of the, the founders of modern Indian theatre. Uh, the most uh, distinctive feature of Kanna's plays is his de deployment of the of historical and mythological resources to tackle very uh, important contemporary themes. For example, Tuglak, as many people know, really can be seen as an allegorical tale of, of the Nehruvian era. The use of traditional Indian narrative material and modes of performance to create a radically modern urban theatre, very different from the Euro-inspired theatre of the middle class, which directly represented you know, the, the very office where Europe had influence, uh, is one of the you know, very distinguishing features of of, of Girish's uh, theatre. He's had a very uh, uh, vibrant and, and a sensitive relation to regional folk tales, the great Indian epic traditions, and historical memory. And in, in doing, uh, in relating to these traditions in the way that he does, he the mimetic and the mythical to be as important a source of self understanding as the more dominant. Uh, intellectual reflective mode that has been pretty dominant you know in the in the in to, to mainstream Western sensibility. Mimetic and mythical cultures that have their beginning in the far more distant past for him uh, are not displaced uh, or lost but only reorganized under new conditions. Uh, and given this very wholesome and comprehensive understanding of what collective self-understanding is. Uh, he, I mean, somehow, get, even, even though he does this, he somehow manages to, in his plays, he manages to appeal to the intellect more than to, you know, mere emotions. I mean, he, he does, of course, uh, uh, evoke a sense of the, you know, the, 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 the emotion, the emotional, but, but he's primarily appealing, even though he's, you know, moving in, this, in these other genres, he manages to 
you know, get our get our intellect going in some ways. Uh, life is uh, uh, contemporary, if not predecessor, uh, Anand Murthy. Karan is firmly, firmly committed to multilingualism. He could easily have written in, in Konkari. Uh, he could have written in the English language, perhaps uh, better than Konkari, but he chose to write in Kannada. Um, he has always fought, like Anand Murthy, has fought hierarchies and binary oppositions between the national and the regional, the center and the periphery the global and the local, the traditional and the modern, and so on. And he's explored uh, the dilemmas and the paradoxes <laughs> facing individuals and societies as they transform one another. And that's uh, also uh, one of the very interesting features of, of uh, Ghanan's writing. Uh, I'll end with, uh, by, by conveying something and by using his own words, and I quote, he says, my generation was the first to come of age after India became independent of British rule. It therefore had to face a situation in which tensions, implicit until then, had to come out in the open and demanded to be resolved without apology or self-justifications. Tension between the cultural past of the country and its colonial past, between the attraction to Western modes of thought and our own traditions, and finally the various visions of the future that opened up once the common cause of political freedom was achieved. This is the historical context that gave rise to my plays, that is his plays, and those of my contemporaries. The contemporaries, of course, being Vijay, Tendulkar, Mohanakesh, Tarabin, Parthi, and of course the, the, the Kannada uh, writer and playwright, Lankesh. Uh, well, <coughs> I think I'd better stop. I said enough. Uh, uh, you would see in, in the lecture many of these things uh, touched upon and a lot more. Uh, so, Tarish, it's a real honor to invite you to speak here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm overwhelmed, actually. So, for the last 25, 30 years, I have always looked on CSDS as a center of intellectual activity, of uh, academic excellence. I have admired the work that's mm. been done here. I have followed mm -hmm. the work. Uh, I've been associated with it sometime. But I have myself never been an academic. Uh, I've never been a teacher, except in theatre. And therefore, I've always admired those who think intellectually. And well, the number of um, mighty intellectuals, if I may use that phrase here, who are present here, whose presence I can feel here. You said that last speaker was Arjuna Padura. Now, Something like that is enough to squash anyone's spirits. I, <laughs> I certainly feel you not up to it. Anyway, thank you very much for taking the risk of inviting me here. Um, I'm an entertainer. I'm basically a playwright. Um, it's, it seems easy to say, what, what is a playwright? A playwright is someone who writes a play. Uh, and if you're looking at the Western culture, it's only for the whole... This, and even in Indian culture, when you look back, you think, there is a vast tradition, a long and ancient tradition of playwriting. You go back to Pasa, who was, supposed, who was supposed to have written in the second century BC, and so on. But the phrase is very ambiguous in Indian culture, because what happens is from second century BC to about sixth century AD, you get Sanskrit plays, you get playwrights. There are plays, you get Kalidasa, you get uh, uh, Bhagavati, you get Shudra, and so on, and so on. Then around the 6th or the 7th century, around then, it's very difficult to define, the playwright ceases to exist. In fact, India, after that, the number of good plays go down and there are almost no playwrights worth mentioning from about the 8th century to the 19th century. Now, this doesn't mean there are no plays in India. No, there's a lot of activity. In fact, all the forms that we call um, the, the traditional forms, um, all emerge during this period because of the Bhakti uh, and the Sufi and other the musical revolution and so on. But the fact remains that there are very few people that you can pick up during this period that you could call uh, a playwright. You know, and this is a very strange phenomenon. And the reason why this, I want to get rid of this out of my way because I stand here as a playwright and suddenly. And this is going to be the point around which I'll build my lecture. Suddenly, in the 19th century, the playwright reappears. 
and he reappears thanks to the colonial influence. The British uh, bring him back again. And this disappearance and appearance of the playwright is, 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 is interesting, very really, um, phenomenon. You see, what happens during these thousand years, during the period that the vernaculars came up and Sanskrit receded in influence um, uh, in the cultural field, is that in the vernacular, the whole nation, the, the whole notion that someone will actually sit down and write up the play and give it to the actors and the actor will take it and you'll learn it by rote and they will come and repeat it, is unacceptable. You know, this is a completely second language um, notion of theatre. You know, in all the Indian languages, what was expected is that the playwright improvised, the, the actor improvised. He went on stage, he rehearsed earlier, he learned his music, he learned his paces, but as it happens even now in Kathakali, as it happens in Yakshagana, it happens in Nautanki, in fact, that the actors go on stage and they improvise, they, you know, uh, and, and they create the whole play. So the actor was also the playwright, the playwright was the actor, and um, this uh, whole notion that he had to come ready-made just was not acceptable till you come uh, to about the 19th century. In the 19th century, and then you have the English influence, the English come, we have the company not a theatre, and it is this, there's a remark there that occurs in the 19th century with which I'm going to start. That's the title of my lecture. Anna Sahib Kiroskar, the great um, uh, theatre man in Marathi, he started, uh, he, uh, on 30th October 1880, he stayed Shakuntal in Marathi, and that is the beginning of the Marathi uh, musical. You know, the whole musical tradition, musical theatre of Marathi starts, and a lot of other things start, about which I will talk about, with that particular thing. It was a very significant moment, and the man was aware of the significance of what he was doing. He did Shakuntal and he did a play called Saubhadra and he died young. So uh, the entire modern Marathi Sangeet Natak tradition, which then goes on and goes on till today, in fact, to some extent, was started by Anna Sahib Kiroskar. And there, in the preface to Saubhadra, he says, I want to create rasa in the English fashion. Ingraji Padatichi Rasanirmiti, that's his exact phrase in Marathi. Ingraji Padati Chirasan. Now, what does it mean? Now, this is a very strange concept because Rasa, one would think, was the ultimate in essential Indian aesthetic um, terminology. You know, it's something that now, now that we have the Nati Shastra, we can trace back to the ninth and the tenth uh, chapters of Nati Shastra and so on. In his time, there was the text of Nati Shastra was probably not available to him, but he probably knew it from the Sharupaka or uh, Abhinay Darpana and so on. But the point is, he says, I want to create, um, and this is the notion that I want to explore today, in, in, as far as, I'm, as uh, from the point of view of an entertainer, as, as I said, not as a scholar. Because the whole concept of rasan obviously means something more to him than it did to the Sanskrit aestheticists. What it means to him, I think, is entertainment. Not their election, what he, he is there, he is a professional, He's doing the play, he's doing it to an audience, and he says, having succeeded in his first play, he says in his second play, now I want to create rasa in the English fashion. And this particular transition from the concept of an aesthetic concept of rasa to something of a professional concept is a very interesting moment in the history of um, Indian theatre. Um, you know, uh, even today, the, the the difference between art and um, culture is not as different as we think. As you know, Marshall McLuhan says in one place, a very perceptive remark, which I must say, he says, an art form is only an entertainment form, which has lost its audience. <laughs> you know, today something is, um, you know, uh, uh, today theatre is an entertainment form, tomorrow it loses its audience, it becomes an art form. Film comes, film loses its audience, it becomes an art form today. So we have television which is an art form, uh, which is an entertainment form and hopefully it will become <laughs> someday an entertainment form. So I'm going now to start with some basics which you, all of you will be completely familiar with but it will enable me to start off my argument to some point which is the beginning of the 
colonial, uh, coming of the colonial uh, power in India. Uh, two moments about which a lot has been written, and you must um, forgive me for repeating the basic points. The first one, of course, is the introduction of English and what the introduction of English did, make all his minutes in 1833, how they changed our concept of uh, thinking about ourselves, how they, we started learning because through English to look at ourselves and analyze ourselves through concepts which were uh, which came from outside. Uh, all, all kinds of concepts close to us, like joint family, like um, uh, religion, for instance, and so on. Uh, we started re-understanding in terms of English, that is one thing. Uh, an interesting word which, um, uh, which is at the center, although I may not use it very much, is the center of my argument is the word uh, for culture, for instance. The word for culture actually comes from the German, uh, has German origin, and Herder and others, and it's associated with the folk and the people close to the, um, you must forgive me if I'm wrong with this, but uh, close to people and so on. But when it is translated, when that word is picked up and imported into India, in Bengali there was a debate on how to translate it. And Suniti Kumar Chatterjee suggested Krishti, which was close to culture because culture comes from agriculture, you know, the whole notion of agriculture and so on. But the word that ultimately won out was the one that was suggested by Ravindranath Tagore, which was Sanskriti, you know, Sanskriti in culture. But immediately the meaning changes. With Sanskriti, you are an upper class, you are far away from the folk, you are right in the heart of the Bhadalok, uh, and you know, refinement. Uh, and although it's the same culture that you're supposed to be talking about, you have already got into another kind of uh, discourse. Now, this is what the use of English and uh, concepts we get from English do to us all the time. That's the first thing. The second element in uh, the colonial experience that I want to point out are the three colonial cities uh, about which uh, Ashish has written so well and so many others. And whatever I'm going to say is more or less uh, a synopsis of what he says, which is that there were these three colonial cities, three I pick up, there were others that came up, but Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay. Uh, what makes them colonial is that there were no cities there before. There were villages. The British came as traders, they started factories, and the factories were started, and around them Indian traders grew, and soon that area, those areas became some kind of townships with a white uh, uh, area which was occupied by the uh, the British and then the black area as it was explicitly called which the Indian traders occupied and these developed into um, um, uh, the interesting thing there was that these cities were dominated by the British which was the British culture you see to when I use the word colonial culture and this has been said thank you um, there were, of course, Indian cities, you know, there were cities like Lahore, there were cities like Delhi, there were cities like Nagpur or Pune or... Um, but the main difference that I see from my point of view, that between the colonial cities and the Indian cities, the traditional Indian cities, was that in, in the in traditional Indian cities, there was a continuity of values between the cities and the countryside. That is, the people in the city were probably more arrogant, than, you know, were arrogant towards those in the villages, everywhere that happens, but the values they believed in, like joint family, like religion, how to uh, respond to your parents, what, how who to marry, whether to marry the first cousin or second cousin, those were common in a sense between the city and the hinterland. And there was a continuity of values and of course there was a continuity of professions. I mean lots of trade workers lived in villages and they came and worked in the cities and went back. So this, flu uh, this fluidity was there, while in the colonial cities, there was a completely new culture which came up, which was the culture of free enterprise. 19th century was the great time of uh, uh, British free enterprise, so that here you get values like competition, that nepotism is bad, that one should uh, allow two people, you know, the, the, the initiative to come up, that caste is wrong, um, you know, and so on. The whole, whole setup of values changes in the initial cities. The main difference between the colonial city and the Indian city, I think, was that while in the Indian city there was a continuity of values from the city to the hinterland, in the colonial city there was a complete disjuncture. You could almost come to the edge of the colonial city and the values stopped. Within that, 
within that area, um, those wealth values operated and Indians who, the Indian bourgeoisie that grew up in those cities uh, accepted those values in public life at least and uh, pretended to be anglicized and so on. Um, but as soon as they moved out of it and into the home, as Ashish has pointed out, these values is to matter. A beautiful example of this is, um, is, a, is a remark in Umrao Janada. Um, you know Umrao Janada and Umrao Janada, she was a um, courtesan of Lucknow. And she mentioned something that happened when uh, Nawab Wajid Ali Shah was the Nawab before the British came um, to uh, Lucknow. What happened? She gives a story which is very interesting. There was a prince, a young prince, who fell in love with a young courtesan. And he went and he started pestering her and the young courtesan threw him out and said, you can't come in. And he was so heartbroken that he went and jumped into the river, trying to commit suicide. You know, the lover, heartbroken lover. But he had a rope. And because of the rope, he didn't drown. He sort of floated down the river. And as he was floating down the river, Nawab Wadid Ali Shah came in his boat. He was boating in the evening and he saw this figure, strange figure floating down the river and he fished him out and he asked him, what is it that had? And the man said, I'm trying to commit suicide. And the king wanted to know why and he said, you know, heartbroken. Uh, and Nawab Wadid Ali Shah was so moved that he made him an officer of the court. And he, being an educated young man, he was a very good officer. Now, having told this story, Umrah makes a very interesting point. She says, such beautiful things used to happen in the days of yore. Now that the British have come, nothing matters except merit. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an extraordinarily perceptive uh, uh, comment on the values that had suddenly uh, changed uh, in the society. And now in the these cities that came up, imitation of the British was easiest in the public sphere. And one of the areas where the imitation was most obvious was in theater. Because, you know, till the 19th century, theater was looked upon, looked down upon in India. I've already mentioned that it was done by people like doing Northern came so on, but it was not done by educated people. It was um, actors and people doing, people doing theater were considered lower down in the social scale. But with the coming of the British, theater gets a new um, a glamour. Because the British themselves idolized theater. They did theater in their clubs. They did plays. Most of all, and I think this must have been a very strong pointer, their men sub, uh, subs acted in the plays. These plays like Goldsmith or um, um, Sheridan and so on, they were done in um, um, uh, the clubs and the main subs used to act. The Indians, of course, were not allowed to attend, but they could see it from the ages. And theater, and then there was, of course, the Victorian groups which came from England, which came in, um, performed here and so on. As a result of which, the Indian bourgeoisie, particularly, I'm talking Indian, uh, uh, Bengal, it was a different situation because of the Madhulok situation. I'll come to that later. But in Bombay, what happens is that the Bombay bourgeoisie begins to imitate and starts theatre. The Parsi start theatre and the Parsi Nata company start. Uh, Nata companies come and they start. And these companies that come, the, 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 the theatre that comes from London introduces two elements which are completely new to Indian theatre. First, first thing of course everyone has talked about, one is the, uh, that was the introduction of uh, the proscenium stage, you know. The uh, British brought proscenium, plays used to happen behind the proscenium, and uh, traditionally Indian plays always happened in the open. There was no de uh, demarcation between the audience and the, no definite demarcation, there was a slight demarcation uh, between the audience and the players. And, um, um, you know, the, with, with, with the Brit British theatre, you have proscenium, things happen behind, the audience is separated from um, the what's happening on stage. And there's a complete demarcation. That was one thing, which of course has been written about by a lot of people. But the more important thing that made a difference was the concept of ticketing. You know, the whole idea of selling tickets for entertainment was completely new in Indian society. Until the 19th century, entertainment was always free. 
some prince or some uh, officer, he sponsored the show. You know, if you wanted a son or if you wanted a daughter or if you wanted to uh, succeed somewhere or you get a job, you went to the temple and you prayed and you said, well, I'm going to uh, sponsor a show and you sponsored the show and then the audience was allowed to come. And the audience sat there. As a result of which, the audience had no investment in theatre. The audience didn't put in any money. It has no financial risk. As a result of which, the audience was capable of taking and did take a kind of aesthetic risk. If a show went wrong, it was okay. I mean, you know. Uh, and the whole tradition we have of improvisation is tied up with this tradition of not selling tickets. Because you know that that tradition today, unfortunately, is more or less disappeared, but continues, fortunately, even in, um, in um, uh, music. You must have heard of great musicians coming drunk. Dim Singh Joshi is a super example. Uh, I mean, you know, if you would come drunk, you would fall asleep. Uh, I was there when uh, the great Mali, uh, the flotist in South Wales, two nights he came sloshed. And the audience came very dutifully, you know, they came first day and the, the sponsor said, sorry, sorry, come tomorrow, sorry, sir. And third day, Mali came and prostrated himself and said, sorry, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm guilty, so I'll play. And he played beautifully. It was a marvelous, and everyone only talked of how beautifully he had played. And not a mention was made of the two previous nights when they had had to go back. Because there was no risk, you know, because that was what artists were supposed to do. And that was the risk that the audience was supposed to take, which is, the, you know, the artist can, may do it or may not do it and so on. But the moment the audience starts paying money for your ticket, the audience starts demanding returns for that money. You know, once you buy a ticket for 10 rupees or 5 rupees, you demand 5 or 10 rupees worth of entertainment. You know, it becomes like a soap dish. And you say, well, you know, uh, there are several things happen. For instance, then if you're paying five rupees, then you want to know what is going to be shown in advance. So you have to be promised, this will be shown, this will be shown, there will be eight songs, ten sceneries, uh, five dances. Fine. Then someone who pays five rupees and comes and says, but you said eight songs, five sceneries, but there are only six songs. What about the two songs? You know, I want the two songs. So the whole concept of entertaining becomes standardized. It becomes a commodity. The second thing that happens, and which really had very damaging effects on uh, uh, Indian theater, is that it leads to replication. People see a play, they love it, they go home, they say, you know, it's beautiful, let's go. And they bring the family, and if the play is different, they're upset. Then they, you know, because they're paying money, and they say to the friends, people, so that each show has to be the same as it was before. And the whole point of improvisation was that plays could be different, that they could be one day, uh, you know, something could be, uh, may work, some next day it may not work. <coughs> this whole concept goes off, and then a whole structure comes up, where, whereby theater as entertainment is commodified and promised in certain degrees. This kind of play will be given, there will be so many songs, there's a star system, the stars will come, and so on. And this fits in perfectly, of course, with the free trade um, the economy of, uh, of, of the cities. And in Bombay, at least, um, you have the Parsis who come in, and the Parsis uh, have Parsi theater, and they, uh, that's called Parsi theater because the money was put in by the Parsis. But soon they realized that doing plays about in Gujarati, which was their mother tongue about um, uh, Shahnama and so on doesn't work. The audience is Hindu, so <coughs> they start doing plays which would attract a Hindu audience. But most of the Hindu audience speak Urdu or Hindi, uh, so they employ Muslim writers. So then you have a secular entertainment setup where you have Parsi managers uh, writing for a Hindu audience with a, a producing plays which were actually written essentially by Muslims. And Aga Kashmiri and people like that. You know, so what happens ultimately is the entire element of ritual, entire element of ritual participation which might have been there is taken out because you have so much secularization going on in the whole process of theater that the theater becomes completely devoid of any values. Entertainment becomes a kind of uh, a, a definition without values, without any kind of traditional um, underlining, underpinning to it. This is one thing. 
The second thing that the British did was, um, which was to really c create quite a, a big uh, problem for the Indians was, they saw Shakespeare as the summum bonum of um, British culture. In, in, British edu in English education, Shakespeare was pushed as the, you know, that uh, this he was taught. Uh, and Indians liked Shakespeare, of course, you know, he, was a, he had a great influence. And he, when, and the playwright was presented as the, the essence of British culture. Now, I think it's a sign of a defeated uh, people that they always want to match the colonizers. And the Indians had to match uh, the British now. They had to find a playwright. But we had no playwrights, you see, as I said. For a thousand years, no vernacular playwrights had come up at all. If, if they had said Milton or if they had said, uh, uh, you know, some epic poet, um, that, that would have been another matter. We had epic poets and so on. If they had said um, um, a singer, whatever it is. But suddenly they had brought out the one phenomenon that didn't exist in India, which was a playwright. You know, except in theater. So there is a wide search for a playwright that would represent the the colonized culture, and we find Kalidasa. Now Kalidasa was always acknowledged as a great Sanskrit playwright, but he was never a national, um, uh, you know, national or cultural um, icon. But in nationalism, of course, in, in 19th century, of course, nationalism is also coming up, and Kalidasa represents uh, this new identity, and this is seen. If you see the translations that take place in the 19th century, not of Shakespeare, Shakespeare of course is translated, but translations of Kalidasa. Because in, between 1860 and 1880 in Marathi, there are four translations of Kalidasa, and in Kannada, there are three. That is, within 20 years, within two neighboring states, there are seven translations of Shakuntala. And suddenly, it, it's almost as though each language had to possess a playwright. You had to have an answer to Shakespeare, you know. And and of course uh, uh, Shakespeare uh, uh, and uh, Shakespeare, of course, was uh, very popular. And he was he. I'm, I'm not going into the other details. For instance, that actually Indians discovered, I think, uh, uh, psychology in Shakespeare. They didn't learn it from Freud or whatever his predecessors were, but by studying Shakespeare. And this you can see by uh, from reading. Uh, the reviews of uh, Hamlet or Lear and so on. And if you look at 19th century, if you want to see the presence of Shakespeare um, in Indian theatre, you should see 19th century Marathi theatre. I told you that in 1880, uh, Anna Sahaya um, did Shakuntal, but it's interesting that he does Shakuntal. That's what I mean. There's a word, you know, that they're going back to Kalidasa as though in, in, uh, in reply to Shakespeare and so on. And he um, um, and he wants a Rasa in English fashion. Then there was another playwright, and his name was Khadilkar. Now Khadilkar wrote a play called um, Kichakwar. You know the story of Kichak. Kichak tried to rape uh, Draupadi, and he was killed by Bhima, and so on and so on. And the play was banned because the government of Brit the British government said Kichak. Well, of course, Draupadi. Draupadi must be Mother India, so that's okay. So who's trying to rape her? So they decided it was Lord Curzon. <laughs> it was not explicitly said, but it was there. <laughs> and, and the band of the, the kitchen would And yet, Khadilkar revives a play of his written earlier called Savai Madhur Ravan Samrutyu, which is the historical play based on the death of Savai Madhur Rao, in which the hero, Savai Madhur Rao, is based on Hamlet, and the villain in, is based on Yago. You know, so almost these, these characters are plucked from, as though they are living creatures in a historical play, taken and put into the play to create the psychological uh, this. And even uh, further example of uh, Shakespeare's influence is Gadkari, a uh, uh, brilliant uh, um, uh, playwright who died young. Uh, Gadkari said, before I die, I want to write 18 plays because I know I'm only half as good as Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare in 36 years. But all these names suggest something, you know, all the Gadakari, Kirloska, these are all upper class names, these are all upper caste names, you know. We are already in 1880s. In 1850s, um, Brahmin women were not allowed to see plays. They were not allowed, if you see Lakshmi Vaikirak's uh, I Fall Off, but she says that she was, you know, she was punished for going to see a play and so on. Within 30 years, the Brahmins are actually doing plays, claiming to, to, it's become an art form, 
And the translation has become possible because clearly doing plays is not a vocation anymore, it's a profession. It's, it's not something that you do as a matter of caste. If you did it as caste, that would be another matter. But now, in a business world, if you do something as business, that's perfectly acceptable. And so theatre becomes a, a business. And you, you, you know, you, you... So there is this phenomenon which you see right through 18th and 19th century. Uh, first example, right, to me, most vividly in theatre, because I belong to the theatre, which is that art forms which were considered traditionally low class and you know which would not be accepted by the upper castes and so on are gradually taken up as business not as vocation not as caste thing um, but as business by upper caste they become part of a, a, a way of making money and in the process they move from villages to towns because all those players who used to do these plays used to live in the villages they are left out and the traditional players are completely left out. The traditional caste, which kept these art forms going, are completely left out. If you ask a Marathi person today, when did Marathi theatre start? He will say 1880. As though there was no theatre before. There was a theatre, but that was kind of entertainment, other forms, which now uh, folklorists are trying to put together. Uh, but official history only acknowledges the moment from which the Brahmin caste picked up the thing. And this phenomenon, this is the point I hope I uh, you must tell me when I go on. Um, this, is, this is a phenomenon that you see in all other art forms. This you see in painting. I mean, if you have read Parthamitra's book, I mean, it's an extraordinary <coughs> example of how the same phenomenon happens in painting, but for different reasons. You see, here in theatre, the Indians did not, the, the Indians voluntarily imitated the British. The British didn't interfere. But in painting what happened is, of course, there was always a great admiration for the British painters during the Mughal regime and so on. But the colonial government decided to teach painting and the, uh, the fine arts to the Indians and the Department of um, um, Education started uh, art schools in Calcutta and Bombay and um, Madras. And um, when it was started, the whole purpose, because they believed, the 19th century uh, um, colonialists believed that um, Essentially, the Indian artist was a, someone who was good at beautiful lines, he was sensuous, but he had no science, and therefore he had no character. If he was given science, then his character, the Indian character would improve uh, with this. And um, um, they tried to bring in an education which was directly brought from um, 19th century teaching in England. As you know, in London there was two uh, debate going on at that time. The Royal Academy had just started in Piccadilly. And Royal Academy had started painting as fine art. You got Joshua Reynolds, or you got Turner, or someone like that. They were painting. And in South Kensington, painting was being taught for industrial workers in the hope of saving it from destruction. The hope was that uh, in the medieval ages there was so much art, and that um, because of modernity, because of industrial revolution, the art may die out. And the attempt was to keep this working class going with the art and typically what the uh, colonial government does is to bring this uh, kind of agenda which was kept for the working class to India to teach in the Calcutta and so on but of course it doesn't work it doesn't work because the whole colonial teaching is so city centric all the colleges are in the cities all the uh, workers are in the uh, you know outside in the countryside uh, they have to pay a fee, they have to buy equipment. The whole thing is impossible for them to come. So as a result, what happens is the people who they enter into these buildings are of course the bourgeoisie. It was the Tagores and the Jaminirais and the, you know, who come. And that, as Parthamitra very clearly it is, creates a completely new class which didn't exist in Indian culture before. The gentleman uh, uh, artist, you know, a person who came. Until then, artists were always those who were who had come from a background of art and uh, had, um, um, you know, uh, inherited the tradition and had continued with this. But now, a new class emerges, the, the um, you know, the bourgeoisie, and they want to, and, and a new distinction arises, which is a, a Victorian distinction which is brought here between the art and the artisan. 
So the artist and the artist. And the artist is one who paints for inspiration. He wants to paint because he's, uh, you know, he's inspired. He's an art and so on. The artisan is one who, who takes, you know, whatever he has been taught through generations, through several things. And this distinction um, ultimately means again that the artisans who had kept art uh, 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 through, uh, alive through the centuries are left out. A new attempt to, is made to create painting in India. The unfortunate part, of course, is that the painting is very sterile um, in Calcutta, particularly. Uh, it goes into the Shantiniketan school and kind of.